the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. There's a lot of people out there trying to get the truth out to you, trying to show you exactly what's going on and what you need to do about it. One of the best is James Corbett of The Corbett Report. He's become a bit of a permanent fixture on internet radio, as well as videos. He's all over. He's been living in Japan quite a while, and he's with us now 11 hours ahead. Hey, James, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm a listener myself. I appreciate your work, and I'm not sure I can live up to the uh, that type of introduction, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I have a feeling you will. But uh, So let me ask you a question. You're in Japan, which is kind of a different place for a Westerner. How'd you wind up there? Well, uh, it's a... Uh... A long story, but the short version is uh, one day I was uh, I was on campus in Dublin. I was in Dublin, Ireland, d doing a master's degree, and uh, I was coming to the end of my time there, and I met one of my friends on campus, and I asked him what he was doing. He said he was looking into teaching English in Asia, and I thought, well, that sounds like an idea. So I started uh, researching online, and next thing I knew, I was heading to the land of the rising sun to become an English teacher, just something that I thought I'd be doing for one year just to pass the time. And here I am eight years later, still here, uh, no longer teaching English, but uh, still here in Japan with my Japanese wife. And uh, that's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Well, it sounds like it crumbled very favorably for you. And, and then... You start out as an English teacher, which probably was pretty satisfying initially, and then you wind up doing radio and media. How did that transition occur? I uh, still don't really know myself. It's <laughs> quite quite overwhelming the uh, the changes, but uh, but basically, uh, it all started about five, uh, six years ago now when I moved into a new apartment here in Japan. It uh, came with an internet connection in the apartment, and it was the first time I'd had internet in my apartment for a few years. So in the time that I hadn't had internet, uh, there had been just some new services crop up like. Google Video and YouTube and some of these newfangled inventions. And uh, uh, I started using them and watching them. And soon, uh, for, through related videos, I started encountering all this information about all these topics that I wouldn't necessarily be thinking about uh, looking into myself, but they were there in the sidebar, so I clicked on them. So I'm suddenly I'm researching about 9/11 and the Federal Reserve and all of these other topics that I would never have really thought to to research on my own. And lo and behold, soon enough, I was uh, just absolutely blown away by the types of information I was finding online, and I wanted to bring some of this to to people's attention. And my initial impulse was just to create uh, CDs of materials uh, that I found useful and hand them out to people, but I figured, well, I'd probably be able to do that a lot more effectively online, so why don't I just start a website? It had never been my intention to start a website or to become involved in media in any way, shape, or form, but there I was starting a, uh, a podcast on a, a pretty horrible, beat-up old uh, laptop with a, uh, a cheap microphone, but uh, that's the way it started, and now five years after that, here I am on radio in, in the U.S. and uh, broadcasting around the world and uh, just absolutely amazed every single day to be waking up to think that I'm doing this as my full-time occupation, as I never, absolutely never could have imagined that this would be what I'd be doing. Hey, you and me both. Uh, this was on my bucket list. I wanted to have a radio show by the time I was 55. I made it about four years early and... You know, I'd never turn back. There's nothing I'd rather do. And I recognize that passion in you that, you know, you've got this international audience. Is any idea how many thousands it runs into? 
I only have the vaguest of ideas. I, I can see on my stats on my server that I've got several thousand daily listeners, but then there's the network. I don't know how many listeners I have on that. And then there's no way to calculate people who are watch, uh, listening on, on terrestrial. So um, I, I really don't know. I honestly have no idea, but it's, it's running into the thousands and tens of thousands and occasionally with some of my viral videos uh, into the millions. And that just blows my mind. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that you can reach out and, you know, I'm sure before you started this, you didn't realize that you had anything to say, that you had an opinion that people wanted to hear, and yet here you are, you're being listened to the world over, and that's got to be a, a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. In a sense, yes, but in a sense, I, I don't think it's about myself or my opinion at, at all. I think really it's about the the content. It's about the the types of things I'm talking about. And to my the the thing that blows me away about all of this is that I never really knew that any of this information even existed. That the, I, I had no idea what the Federal Reserve was or why it was important or any of these types of issues. And in just in discovering that, it's really really. Uh, every day I'm just amazed at, at, at the type of information I'm discovering. And I, I use that as a pretty good you know, rubric for, for deciding whether or not an audience is going to be impressed by information. If I'm blown away by something, I'm pretty sure that if I just accurately convey that to the audience, they'll be blown away. And, uh, and so far, I, I think I have been pretty successful at that. And, and that's, that's pretty much all I'm in it for is to try to pass this information along. Oh, that's great. So it's kind of a mutual discovery you discover along with your audience. And then I know for myself, a lot of people send in clips and links, and I try to view as many of them as possible. So you kind of build this thing together. That's exactly right. It is a collaborative effort in a lot of ways, and it feeds off of each other and 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 off of the feedback that I get. But at the end of the day, it is really about uh, myself and my own process of discovery and what I'm learning. And I'm just trying to pass that along to people. So it's, uh, I think it's win-win for everyone because uh, I, I'm sure the audience out there gets something out of the, the research that I'm doing. And certainly I am spurred into, into more and more research because I have, I have this, this media platform now, so I, I have to do something with it. And so I'm every day uh, going through the headlines and, and uh, researching all sorts of different nooks and crannies of history and uh, philosophy and politics and science and all sorts of things that, once again, I'm not sure I'd be uh, researching into at all if I didn't have this website. So, so it's definitely a good thing for, for myself and I hope for the audience as well. Yeah, well, we all uh, kind of do the same thing and grow together because you mentioned you started out with a beat-up notebook and a microphone, and now you're obviously very technically astute, sophisticated. You know, your production values are very high, and that's a journey that takes place over time. Well, I'm getting there at any rate. But yes, absolutely. I'm completely autodidactic at all of this. I've never had any formal training whatsoever in any media. And so uh, everything that I do is is a process of discovery and trial and error. And uh, I, I shudder to think of people who go and listen to my archives from episode one, because the quality is not quite where I would have wanted it to be. But but at the same time, I, I always say that to people out there. Well, you might not think that you, you're able to do this, but uh, but maybe that's just because you haven't tried. And honestly, if you don't get out there and try, you'll never know. So it's always a big part of my message that uh, that people out there who are who are thinking about getting into this or thinking about doing this for themselves, I always encourage them to go for it because absolutely this is not some sort of uh, brain surgery that I'm doing here. It's, it's really just my best effort. And if I can do this, I, I really do have faith that pretty much anyone out there can teach themselves to do this. Uh, there's no question about it. Myself, I took a uh, course uh, from this guy, the podcast Answer Man. It was a, an online course, pretty much told you everything you needed to do. I was already posting shows and they were pretty rotten, if I have to say so myself. Like I, I would love to take them down, but you know that I don't think it's right to do that because people need to know the truth about you, about everything. And you know, somehow you evolve as a person. Let me ask you a question. What do you think that is the best thing that's happened to you since you started your media career? That's an excellent question. Well, I, I think my wife would be disappointed if I didn't say I married my wife, but <laughs> that might be tangential. Um, in terms of the actual media platform, I think it's honestly, it's getting to work with and correspond with and even become 
uh, friends with, people that I was just listening to or was just uh, uh, looking at the, the work they were producing or, 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 or whatever the case may be. And suddenly I'm interviewing these people and in some cases even working with these people. And it's, it's truly mind-blowing uh, to, to have that kind of experience, to be able to work with someone like Sibel Edmonds, the FBI whistleblower, or, or Bob Chapman, who uh, I know you and I both know quite well from the International sure. Forecaster, and some of the other people that I've, uh, I've gotten to talk to and, and even become friends with along the way. It's, it's really been just I have to pinch myself sometimes to make sure I'm not dreaming. Oh, I totally know what you mean. You get, you get you get the inside uh connection with these people and it a thing about the internet that amazes me is public people are so accessible generally and if they're not if it's public person and he's not accessible I say okay that's fine you want your privacy whatever goodbye but but pretty much everyone is out there welcoming you. It it is surprising. I, I that was one of the things that w- that really surprised me when I first got into this. I figured, well, no one would want to talk to me because I didn't have any really history. I didn't have any archives. No one knew who I was. But all I did was just send out interview requests, and more more often than not, people would grant them. So, it's uh, it's quite a quite a mind blowing experience to start uh, not just listening to these interesting conversations that I was listening to online, but to actually participate in them and add my voice to the mix. And uh, again, I think that's that's only for the benefit of society, the more people who get involved in this and stop taking it as some sort of passive activity just to uh, to occupy their minds and, and actually start getting involved in it and inserting themselves into it, that can only be for the good. And even if I don't agree with uh, with what some people out there are saying or doing, I certainly do agree with their ability to, to, to add that voice to the mix because uh, I don't think I'm going to solve all of society's problems myself. I think it's only going to come when, when people start getting actively engaged in it. And now that we live in the internet age, it is so easy to actually become engaged. We are living in an age that we are absolutely spoiled to have the, the riches of, of the sum total of human knowledge and history at our fingertips. And people who aren't making the most of that, I just, I, I don't get it because this is an, a very exciting time to be alive. I totally agree with you. So you hooked up with Bob Chapman. Tell us how that happened and his impact on your life. It started out quite uh, quite innocently, I suppose. I just, uh, once again, just put an email out to him. I, I'd heard him many times on the radio on various programs, so I wanted to have him on my program. So I, I put out an interview request for him, and he agreed to it, and we had a nice conversation. And from that, it became, well, I'll be happy to have you on again. And then uh, it started to become a monthly conversation. And then in the last uh, year or so of his life, we started to have a weekly uh, interview. And uh, and again, it was just mind blowing to have access to to Bob Chapman's mind and his experience and all uh, all of the things that that he has knowledge of to to be able to access that on a weekly basis and and basically pick his brain about what was going on in the world was uh, just a an incredible experience for me and uh, and quite an honor. Yeah, I feel the same way and in a way I feel like he gave me my start. I mean, I wanted to do it and I had been corresponding with him and Chris Waltzek for a long time till I finally said I could do this, you know, I think I can do this. And you know, it just went on from there. And, you know, without people welcoming you into this community, that would be a really difficult thing when, when you didn't have the internet to break into this fraternity of higher financial thinkers was all but impossible. Exactly right. And, uh, and once again, it, Bob opened so many doors for me and he really ended up getting me my, my spot on, on the radio and all of that. So, so honestly, he did so much for me behind the scenes. I, I was always really humbled to see how, how hard he fought for me. And, uh, considering we never even met in real life, never, never met in person. So, but he, he, he was always in my corner and, and he did so many things for me behind the scenes. So I really do owe him a lot in, in terms of all of this, including of course, just the, all of that knowledge and uh, experience that he was able to share with me and my listeners on a weekly basis. Just, just an incredible, incredible man. And he gave so much of himself. Yeah. He really didn't hold anything back and he was really out there and now lo and behold you know well we're all saddened that he's gone greatly saddened he did have a full life you're now writing for the international forecaster 
again, it's just one of those things that I, I it absolutely blows me away to think about. But yes, uh, in the last uh, few months there, as he was uh, starting to wane physically, he uh, asked me to come on and start uh, writing an editorial for the forecaster. And after his uh, passing, his family uh, asked me to continue doing that. And I'm certainly happy to do it. So every every week when the forecaster comes out, it comes out with an editorial from from myself on various financial and geopolitical events. So I'm, I'm just trying to carry on whatever kind of legacy that I can from, from Bob Chapman. Now, they're obviously too big a shoe to fill, but I'm just doing my best trying to, to, to carry on some of that light that he helped share with me and my audience. Yeah. Yep. He's a tough act to follow. That's for sure. And now that you're writing about the economy, you're, ed- you're effectively providing editorial content every week. What do you think the prospects are for the world economy as it stands now? Uh, I wish I could be the bearer of glad tidings, but I just don't see that. I think we are on the precipice in so many different ways. And unfortunately, all we've seen is the uh, the opening of the floodgates, the, uh, the turning of the spigot, the uh, QE infinity inflation into nothing. That is is just a mathematical certainty at this point. And all the only question is when and how it's going to play out. But uh, now that we have not only the Federal Reserve, but also, of course, the European Central Bank and the European Stability Mechanism and China and Japan and all of these different countries that are that are engaging in quantitative easing at the same time. They may be devaluing their currencies together, so it doesn't seem that uh, that they're being devalued unless you actually look at the uh, the precious metals markets. But uh, but it's going to uh, to to strike even the the most uh, befuddled and confused of investors at some point that 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 it's really heading into the uh, into the toilet and um, unfortunately I just don't see a way out of it and I don't see anything approaching the political will that would be necessary to turn things around at this point. The political will or the political honesty of which there's a complete absence of, regardless how free any country may consider itself to be. And James, what gets me is. QE1 failed, QE2 failed, Operation Twist failed, QE2 Light failed. Every single time they've done it, it's failed. And yet they're embracing failure. And I don't know, my parents, if I kept failing the same vocabulary test, misspelling the words the same way, they would have taken a rod to me eventually. Said, like, how can you be so stupid? And yet this is what we're stuck with. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, in a way, uh, certainly from from our perspective, they've they've failed miserably. But from the perspective of the the people who are running the system, I think that uh, they're they're doing a, a bang up job. They're doing great. They're doing exactly what they're they're they've been put in there to do, which is um, to to keep the uh, the system limping along as long as humanly possible. And uh, to while they're at it, why not? Let's uh, let's bail out the banks. Let's recapitalize them. Let's make sure that uh, the the U.S. Uh, the major U.S. banks now have more holdings in uh, more reserves in the Federal Reserve banking system than they ever have before, one and a half trillion dollars worth and counting. And it's just a system that's feeding on itself. And and it's it's amazing to me how just barefaced it is now with QE3, with these uh, $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed security purchases that are somehow supposed to to be uh, influencing the employment rate. I, I'm not sure the, uh, the the directness of that mechanism between MBS and uh, the, yeah. the employment figures, but uh, it, it just goes to show that I think they're they're removing any pretense that this is about Main Street. It's all about uh, Helicopter Ben just uh, raining down on Wall Street exactly like he promised. Yeah, it's, it's fraudulent on its face. It only helps the too big to fails. It provides, it helps New York State where I happen to live for right now, although I'm getting out shortly, uh, because Wall Street, the too big to fails, they pay taxes on all their their unreal profits because their profits aren't real. They're all insolvent. The executives of those too big to fail institutions, they pay taxes on their undeserved bonuses and everybody's happy except if you're on Main Street, you're struggling, you're, you have a shred of self-respect left so you won't take food stamps, you won't go on disability even though your unemployment's running out. If you're Joe Sixpack, James, what do you do? 
Well, it's a dire situation, and you bring up all of the the various government handouts that unfortunately are becoming more and more common and more and more necessary for more and more people. And I'm not sure if we can really blame the people for for taking advantage of those because they've been put on the plate there. I think what we have to look at is the entire system that's been built up around this, and it has to go back to to institutions like the Federal Reserve, which is the fundamental regulation on the monetary system itself, and the uh, the fact that uh, that there is this uh, not only this this fiat currency but the fact that it's a monopoly on currency if we could at least just uh, legalize competition as as Ron Paul or others would put it we could at least start to transition off of the system that we've been put onto and start to build up alternative currencies of various stripes and uh, let the market decide what should actually work but since we're so so absolutely ensconced in the system now and most people don't have a leg to stand on financially, it's uh, getting harder and harder to actually fight back against the system. So I guess the end result is we're all going down with the ship. Well, not all of us. I think for the people who have been uh, investing in, in precious metals and, and the the you know the long term savings that are going to to survive whatever paper collapse is going to happen i think they're going to be ahead of the game but it's certainly not going to be a fun slide for anyone um at least that you know that you and i would know or correspond with on a daily basis so it's going to be a pretty nightmarish uh, ride and it's a question of how how people are going to either pull together or uh, hang separate i suppose uh, when when the uh, the final when the final uh, dr- trap door is pulled and we we all go down, we'll we'll have to see how that plays out. But there's so many different ways that could play out at the moment with so much uh, geopolitical instability. And as we always know, in the times of economic instability comes uh, times of increased war. And uh, it looks like that's shaping up on just about every front we can imagine right now. It sure does. And that's an interesting point you raise because when everybody's fat, dumb and happy making money, nobody wants to end the party with a war or something like that it's when the economy goes south that's when the uh, the knives as it will come out so i understand you've got a book coming out i do and i've only been promising it for um going on three years now so i'm not that far behind schedule um, <laughs> all right better <laughs> better late <laughs> Exactly. I'm really going to make a concerted effort to get it out before the end of the year, though. So we'll definitely uh, try our best to do that. But uh, it's coming along slowly. It's a collection of essays that I'm working on and have been for some time, obviously. And uh, I think events are overtaking some of my essays, so I'll have to continue rewriting them. But it's a question of finding time to do so with all of the other media work I'm doing. But yes, I certainly hope to have that book out by the end of the year. It's called Reportage Essays on the New World Order. Yeah, I like it. I like the title. I've got a book coming out myself the next couple of weeks called uh, Sweep the Street, A Guide to Real Wealth, because people need to understand the money system, how we got where we are in order to understand how we need to get back to where we were, I think. So, James, really been an enlightening uh, interview. I appreciate your coming on here, sharing your thoughts. And is there any piece of advice your best advice to give to give people out there to give you on how you get ready for the inevitable global economic reboot um i guess my my final advice would be communities are what will see us through at the end of the day it's not going to be some uh, political savior from washington or whatever from on high to come that will come down and save you it's going to be the people that you know and that you work with and you live with so i think people have to start investing in their own communities in every way possible and trying to get get off of that system that uh, that is leading them out into this uh, this the, the edge of the precipice and uh, there are so many different ways to do that uh, alternative local currencies and uh, local markets um, local exchanges all of these things are extremely important and only going to become more so as as unfortunately we do head into this extremely destabilized time so so that's my number one piece of advice and my number two is that uh, cognitive liberty and cognitive independence is is the real key 
key to the system. So so detaching yourself from whatever uh, mainstream type of information you might uh, you might be hooked on and trying to get uh, as many alternative perspectives as possible. And that doesn't mean that alternative media is always correct or is always infallible, but it does mean that uh, it, at the very least, it's not controlled by the same few corporations that are invested in the system. So I think people have to start branching out and uh, and absolutely preparing themselves in every way possible. Yeah, I think Charles Hugh Smith has mentioned that. Invest locally. I've said it myself. Build your community. It's hard to do, but it requires a, a conscious effort, and it can be done. Um, so, James, finding you on the internet's fairly easy. I know we have CorbettReport.com. Where else do we find you? I have uh, FukushimaUpdate.com where I'm keeping an eye on what's going on here with the Fukushima nuclear situation. I have ReportageBook.com where I'll have more information about my book when it becomes available, etc., etc. I'm on BoilingFrogsPost.com, obviously on the International Forecaster, on GlobalResearch.ca, many, many different places. But CorbettReport.com is the place to go, is the one-stop shop, and you can find all my other work there. And that's where I go to find you myself. And James, it's been an interesting time that we spent together here. I really appreciate your coming on, telling us about you, about your evolution as a broadcaster from somebody who never saw themselves going into it. And yet here you are, perhaps not a household name, but people who are looking to wake up about the economy, about the world, no doubt they come across you. And for that, we're eternally grateful. Well, I'm grateful for you having me on, and I'm looking forward to you being on my radio program again in the near future. Hey, I look forward to it also, and you can find this interview as well as zillions of others, important information on preparing for the economic reboot on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. James, we'll talk to you again real soon. Take care. You too.